Al-Jabri, I assume or I think that any serious uh, scholar of Arab Islamic contemporary uh, thought should be um, acquainted with the scholar for one main reason. He systematized the Arab Islamic library or Arab Islamic tradition. He, uh, he is well known for his uh, critique of Arab reason, which is uh, four volumes from the 1980s to 2000. And for the last decade of his life, uh, he also produced four volumes on the Quran. Besides these, he engaged Arab scholarship and produced his own opinion, uh, his opinions in various books on Arab education and Arab renewal, uh, pluralism, the state, democracy, human rights. So who is Al-Jabri? He is um, Moroccan of origin, but his heart was, uh, was Arab and Islamic also. Uh, in his sketch, I would say he was an educationist, he was a scholar philosopher, and he was an ideologue. Born in the east of Morocco, for, for, of Berber origin, um, he did not join the French school only for a short time, so his uh, scholarship was basically national and Arab. He uh, spent only one year in Syria in his out, uh, overseas studies where um, before um, moving to philosophy he was uh, uh, interested in mathematics but change happened. He spent three months in Paris where he intended to do his studies but he went back uh, in no more than three months of his stay because he felt and he was encouraged by the leader of the uh, the Moroccan left, Ben Barka, um, and the third worldist, uh, whose issue I think is um, international. So he was encouraged to go back and contribute. So uh, from his early age, he started writing, uh, theorizing for the, uh, the political party he belonged to, the Nationalist Party, and afterwards the, uh, the Socialist Party. He remained with the Socialist Party uh, till uh, 81, 82, and then decided to leave uh, to focus on his uh, uh, scholarly uh, project, Arab, Arab thought. As a teacher, he, he started as primary school teacher, and then um, high school teacher, and, philo and uh, teacher of philosophy, and the first uh, doctor from modern school in Moroccan university. Um, and he is well known not only in the country but in the, uh, the Arab Islamic world um, on one of the, uh, the projects, especially in the country, that influenced so many in North Africa at least is that uh, because he produced uh, uh, high school textbooks on, on philosophy and uh, most of contemporary uh, Moroccan scholars of philosophy in North Africa also um, were his students. Not all of them have taken his path, but they acknowledge um, the influence he had on them. The interest, why this, uh, why he remains an interesting figure, Though in, in Western or English-speaking uh, scholarship, he remains, I should say, uh, less so. In a presentation um, a student presented on him a couple of months ago during the conference, he, he tried to give a statistical view of where, how much uh, algebra is quoted. And uh, uh, you, could, uh, you could see the, the little percentage of uh, references uh, he enjoys. <coughs> And Fred Dalmayer, an American philosopher, political theorist, says that one of the reasons why Al-Jabri is not well known in the, American, in the English speaking world and the West in particular is that uh, Al-Jabri defended the idea of uh, social democracy, or he used the word social democracy. <coughs> he was a leftist, but not as the Arab leftists of the time, from the 50s and 60s. Uh, his leftism was different. 
was not anti-religious, and we'll see to that. That's why he kept the idea of socialism um, uh, alive in his project. The Muslim Brotherhood was founded in 1928 by Hassan al-Banna in the Suez city of Ismailia. Uh, their slogan as a small organization was, the Quran is our constitution, and the group carried their message at first to mosques and cafes. The Muslim Brotherhood started as a small organization by preaching in mosques and grew into one of the largest political organizations in Egypt. By the 1940s, the membership was thought to be up to half a million people in a nation of 15 to 20 million. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood rose up during the British occupation of Egypt, and they also rose up in a very critical time of Arab intellectual history called the Nahda. The Nahda movement means the Renaissance. And it was a time, it was the end of the Ottoman Empire, and the Islamic world for the first time in many, many centuries was facing a world in which they did not have a caliph and they did not have a central authority. And so the Arab world was engaged in a deep intellectual debate about how to uh, combat this. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the Muslim Brotherhood was contemporaneous with that movement. And I would argue that, and I don't say this is a value neutral statement, but I believe that the, um, that the Muslim Brotherhood is at its core a, a reactionary movement. What that means is that the group rose to combat what was seen as dangerous levels of liberalization in Egypt due to this Nahda movement in the late 19th, early 20th century that saw the rise also of British colonialism and of liberal newspapers springing up everywhere. Uh, there's a great book by Beth Barron that's called the, the Orphan Scandal, and it gives a fascinating close reading of how the Muslim Brotherhood was able to seize on growing public anger against, um, against Western Christian missionaries. Okay, so that's one element in which, one way in which they were reactionary. Um, <clears throat> it's well known that, that uh, the Hassan al-Banna was a disciple of somebody named Rashid, Muhammad Rashid Rida, who was a major luminary of this Nahda movement. Rida was a disciple of someone named Muhammad Abdu, who was, uh, who was the Grand Mufti of Al-Azhar, the biggest seat of Sunni learning, when he died in 1905. So um, according to Muhammad Qasim Zaman, he understands Rida, who is Hassan al-Banna, Hassan al-Banna is the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, He's influenced by someone named Rida. And he, Zaman, a scholar, describes Rida as a Salafi. Okay, now what does that mean? The term Salafi is used for by those who reject the authority of the medieval schools of law and insist on unmediated access to the foundational texts as the source of all norms. In the late 19th, early 20th century, this period, it was likewise employed as a self-designation by Rida and his close associates to denote an approach to Islam that was anchored in the foundational text and in, and in the example of the pious forgivers, the Salaf, the followers of the Prophet, as, contested, as contrasted with understandings of Islam that are distorted, quote, distorted by centuries of legal, theological, and mystical debates, um, self-serving ulama and despotic rulers. Um, sounds like a Jabri, as we just heard, was maybe somebody who also opposed that, that, that trend toward the mystical and toward the, toward the interpretations of the school of laws. One of the most stunning aspects of Morsi's one year of rule, was, uh, the Brotherhood, was that, so basically, the debate here is about whether the Muslim Brotherhood is part of this Nahda movement, which is considered Arab modernity. Okay, and somebody like Tariq Ramadan, who is certainly no fan of what's happening today in Egypt and no fan of Sisi, goes out of his way to argue that the Muslim Brotherhood is part of the Nahda movement, is precisely part of this modernist movement in Egypt. So therefore, the idea that you know, this is um, a bunch of modern liberals, and if, I don't know if, how well you know Egypt, but the notion that it's overrun by liberals is, is not supportable by evidence. Um, <laughs> So the notion that uh, it's, it's modern liberals that are, that are sort of attacking these traditionalists out of sheer prejudice is something that is very commonly said in Western Academy today, but has absolutely no evidence, um, either empirical or, or historical, okay? And um, one of the most stunning aspects of Morsi's one year of rule was that the Brotherhood not only did not have any deep or detailed political platform, they also did not have a particular theological or Islamic legal platform. 
which would sort of support this contention. They actually don't belong to a school of law. They didn't seem to have any real theological, not to mention political plan. Um, so it suggests to me that it seems to be an organization that foregrounds and emphasizes a kind of authoritarian aura, you know, a stark understanding of Islam, perhaps a certain Salafi one, and it did not bother with more detail than that. So this is a strategic ambiguity, I think, that ended up in practice making the Muslim Brotherhood vulnerable to being swayed to the right by their rightward Salafi competition. And I think we saw this in their year of power, that because they didn't actually have a platform, the Salafis to their right, who want to lower the, the marriage age for, for women to get married, who want to introduce a lot of things that a lot of people oppose, the Muslim Brotherhood had to concede to them because you know, they're their biggest challenge. It was not the liberals, it was to their right. It was the Salafis. Okay, so, um, so what does the fact that the Muslim Brotherhood is precisely a founding member of the Islamic world's only engagement with modernity mean for Assad's notion that it was modern liberal Egyptians that opposed Morsi's regime because of their dislike of public religion. As I said earlier, I don't believe that the notion that, that the fall of Morsi came at the hands of mostly liberals is empirically correct. Beyond this, it is clear that we cannot conflate the Muslim Brotherhood with its particular genealogy and social history with Islam or Islam in Egypt. It's a they're, they're just two different things. I mean, not that they're not Muslim, they are. But there's a conflation of somehow Islam in the public space with the Muslim Brotherhood. That's incorrect. There are a lot of conservative Muslims, a majority of conservative Muslims that have nothing to do with the Muslim Brotherhood. It's a different story. Um, <clears throat> this movement represents a distinct Islamic expression and one that is opposed at this point by a large number of Egyptians. Furthermore, the notion that the Muslim Brotherhood itself is not modern is likewise unsupported. So I fear, in conclusion, that in many Western academic discussions of the popularly backed coup of 2013, we make some consistent errors. One, the first is to underplay or deny the mass public revolt that led to the coup. Two, is to impose a Western academic, there's a kind of Western academic battle brewing now between liberalism and everything else. And liberalism is now the enemy in a lot of um, Western production, particularly regarding the Middle East. That's fine, that's an interesting Western debate, but it shouldn't just be imposed on what's happening in Egypt. It's not really particularly relevant. I don't think it's the most important frame, you know, that it's a, it's a big war between liberals and traditionalists. I'm not sure that's exactly the best way of looking at it. Um, <clears throat> so, I suggest that a better point of departure, which would be more true to the Egyptian context, is to ask why Egyptians, in a very large majority, chose the military, a military dictatorship, over the Islamists. That is what happened. Okay, so we need to be asking why that is. Um, even as the current military regime continues its oppression against all forms of dissent. During the Arab culture renaissance of the 18th, 19th century, a new modern Arab civil society developed and the modern traditional intellectual appeared for the first time. This first generation pushed a constitutional reform inside the Ottoman Empire. And the second one that followed rose between the two world wars with the main goal of achieving independence from European colonialism. The political slogan of the third generation of Arab intellectuals became more radicals and ideologies such as Arab nationalism and Arab uh, socialism merge with the political agenda and giving birth to proper political program. In the 70s, with the rise of authoritarian regime in the regions, the Arab, uh, uh, the Arab public sphere underwent a downsizing process and the evolution of political ideas par partially declined. In Syria, for instance, the censorship on the cultural opposition, the endemic patronage, and the ruralization of the Ba'ath party, the Syrian state, and the society caused the intellectual depauperation of the public spheres. The institutionalization of predatory regimes, as in Syria, Libya, Iraq, and Egypt, characterized by censorship, corruption, clientelism, authoritarianism, repression, weakened the civil society and the social and cultural fabric of their states. The, the Arab nationalist movement in, uh, in, um, and the Ba'ath Party in Syria and in Iraq were envisioned as instruments for modernization and economic justice, 
but the party and its ideas were soon hijacked and degraded into populist movement characterized by empty slogan coined by military elements in order to justify a personal political agenda. At the same time, in Egypt, Arab socialism became little more than a pretext for dictatorship. So, in addition, on a broader level, we witnesses the persistence of the Arab-Israeli conflict, the Lebanese civil war, which deprived the region of one of its cultural hubs, the 1979 Iranian Revolution, along with the growing economic influence of the, Arab, uh, uh, of the Gulf states, all these events, in my opinion, played a major role on the deterioration of the Arab culture and public sphere. So from the 70s on, the Arab culture seems to become more insular, having exhausted the revolutionary motivation that in the previous decades opened the way to the ideologies of, na of Arab nationalism and Arab socialism. So for these reasons, the Arab intellectual who have lived between brutal state repression and the growing Islamic orthodoxy had to, choose, had to choose between exile, where, however, they lost touch with the, lived the reality of their society, or being co-opted by their governments. But those who refused and continued to be an active part of the Arab society had to face threats, detention, and even deaths, as, for instance, Samir Kassir, the Lebanese journalist was assassinated in Beirut in 2005. So we have seen why and how the figure of the traditional intellectual is slowly fading from the Arab public sphere. And the eruption of the mass protest in 2010-2011 seems to prove that this. But in fact, to, move, to be more precise, in the Arab squares raise a new protagonist, a new personality that is different from the traditional intellectual we were used to and whose emergence was unforeseen. Now, we can return to Antonio Gramsci's ideas to explain and to describe this new character and the role he played in the unfinished Arab Spring context. So namely, I'd like to quote the Gramsci's ideas that all men are intellectual but not all men have in the society the function of the intellectual. So in distinguishes between intellectuals and non-intellectuals, Gramsci is referring to the social function or better to the role that the individual intellectual is playing within the society. So by applying this idea to the Middle Eastern context, I'd argue that Gramsci theory can be turned around and that during the Arab Spring, the people that went into the streets and squares calling for justice, human dignity, freedom, democracy, have played the function of the intellectual without being them. So to depict and to examine in depth this new figure, in my opinion, it is also necessary to recall what Edward Said said in his 1993 race lectures about the role of the intellectual. The intellectual is an individual endowed with the faculty of representing, embodying, articulating a message, a view, an attitude, a philosophy or opinion. And this role has an edge to it and cannot be played without a sense of being someone whose place is this publishing to raise embarrassing questions, to confront orthodoxy and dogma, to be someone who cannot be easily co-opted by governments or corporations and whose raison d'etre is to represent all those people and issues that are routinely forgotten or swept under the rug. The intellectuals does so on the basis of universal principles that all human beings are entitled to expect decent standard of behaviors concerning freedom and justice from worldly powers or nation. So, if we merge together the Gramsci's ideas that all men are intellectuals depending by the function they play within the society, with the function that Said assigned to them, we have a new type of intellectual who could be defined as, for instance, an intellectual in revolt. It is this new character, in my opinion, that has played the leading role during the Arab Spring. Now, the most important binary that I want to talk about today here is um, in addition to these is the Eurocentrism nativism binary. Um, the, 
basically, uh, so far, or at least up until um, um, few, uh, the last decades, uh, maybe the recent decades of, last decades of, of the 20th century and the first decades of the 21st century, uh, the response in the Middle East and North Africa towards what we refer to as modernity, and that is a very, uh, I would put it, dogmatic definition of modernity that, that uh, assumes that modernity starts, is started in Europe and is unique to Europe and is impossible anywhere else. And if you want to be modern, you have to follow the example of Europe. That kind of modernity has, has generated two um, sorts of responses in the Middle East and North Africa or in anywhere that is in the periphery of Europe. One response has been complete embracing of, the, of that idea um, that we refer to as Eurocentrism in the literature. Um, an Iranian intellectual by the name of uh, Jalal al-Ahmad refers to it as West toxication. Um, I will talk about West toxication more. It's the title of a, uh, of a book that he wrote that was banned uh, during the, uh, the Shah's re regime um, up until 1979. Um, the other binary, which has not been talked about much, uh, the other side of the binary is nativism, which is complete rejection of anything that comes out of the West, including democracy, rule of law, individuality, or individualism, um, free will. And I, am ar I argue that that is equally detrimental to the process of, of uh, political justice, social justice, democracy, and the rule of law in the Middle East. Now, nativism in the broad sense is the doctrine that calls for the resurgence reinstatement or continuous of native or indigenous cultural customs, beliefs, and values. This is uh, the best definition that I could find in the literature. This is from a book called Iranian Intellectuals and the West by uh, Dr. Bru Jerdi. He's at Syracuse University. Now, the proponents of nativism were adamant about ending their condition of mental servitude and their perceived inferiority complex towards the West, what they refer to as the West. Um, likewise, another Iranian um, intellectual uh, defines nativism as an attempt to return to a utopian past where agency is absolute. Um, he observes that uh, the crisis of nativist imagination is that in the post-colonial world, there is no option of returning home. So he is basically talking about the impossibility of the idea of nativism, of the idea of completely breaking away from the, the West. Um, he argues that the top-down paradigm of modernization slips into the past amid the unruly energies of globalization, energies which create an unconscious sense of rootlessness and anxiety caused by the decentering experiences of modernity. Thus, to this second uh, scholar, Dr. Mir Sapasi, nativism is a self-defeating project, uh, for it ignores the realities of the modern world. In, in such a theoretical paradigm, Islamist movements are the latest manifestation of a nativist thought. For example, um, ISIS, um, any kind of Islamic, Islamist movement that calls for the creation of this Islamic utopia or the Islamic caliphate based on Sharia law is nativist and is doomed to fail. Um, now, what I'm trying to talk about is this, what I'm trying to say is this, these two are the first pill and the second pill. What I am trying to say is that there should be a third pill that would be, be that would go beyond the Eurocentrism, nativism binary. Now, I also argue that the, uh, the process of, of coming up with this third way um, 
that goes beyond this binary has already started. Um, uh, here I refer to an article by uh, Professor Dabashi at New York University. He calls the article the epistemic shift. And this is how he defines it. Um, I'm actually rephrasing here. So as a result of uh, post-colonial literature produced by Edward Said, Franz Fanon, Gayatri Spivak, to name only a few, what we witness, what we used to refer to as the periphery of European modernity, both, both in the cultural and colonial senses, is now in the midst of reassuming a position towards the core. The problem is that fostering an indigenous modernity that would be embedded in a society's cultural tradition will not be possible without a thorough interrogation of European modernity. Interrogation should certainly also be accompanied by enlightenment about the generally overlooked fact that the so-called East and West have always been enmeshed in a cultural flux through which both sides have shaped each other.